Uh, according to resolution of the House on Wednesday the 17th of November 2021, proceedings are now interrupted to enable the Honourable Peter Poulos to make his first speech without any question before the Chair. Before I ask the Honourable Peter Poulos to come forth, I do want to recognise a number of special guests of Peter's tonight. I'd like to welcome into my gallery this evening uh, his wonderful wife, Vicky Poulos, uh, and their children, Miss Maria Poulos, Master John Poulos, give us a smile, and Miss Christina Poulos, along with Mrs Maria Poulos, his mother, uh, Mr Emmanuel Poulos, his brother, Mrs Christina Patsos, his long-suffering mother-in-law, <laughs> and Mrs Joanne Suvaliotis. Uh, I think I got pronunciation right, his sister-in-law, indeed. Welcome all very much. And I also have the pleasure in, in welcoming the Premier, the Honourable Dominique Perrottet, uh, and indeed uh, the Treasurer, the Honourable Matt Keane, and the former President of this House, the Honourable John Ajaka. Hey. Hey. Yes, he's back, he's back. Watch out, he's back. I also warmly welcome His Grace Bishop Bartholomew of Chariopolis, representing His Eminence Archbishop Macarius, Primate of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of Australia. Indeed, welcome, sir. I welcome you all for uh, Peter's Honourable uh, Peter Poulos's first speech. I also recognise those people in the upper gallery. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. And indeed, the people gathered in the strangers' dining room who are watching a live stream of these proceedings. And I also note um, that uh, the Honourable Peter Poulos has informed me that uh, we're going live to Greece uh, via his website, uh, his new website. And uh, indeed, uh, we have the YouTube channel broadcasting everywhere else as well. So we're going global tonight in the Legislative Council. So with those few words, I now call the Honourable Peter Poulos. And before he does speak, I remind members, uh, as it is his first speech, that uh, members provide him with the usual courtesies. The Honourable Peter Poulos. Mr President, I rise to deliver my inaugural address with the indulgence of all honourable members in our oldest parliament within this blessed Commonwealth. It is indeed a great privilege to serve in the Legislative Council as it approaches its bicentenary and my primary focus shall be to represent the people of New South Wales for the betterment of all. In recent parliamentary sittings, we have found it necessary to adapt to a set of extraordinary circumstances. Fortunately, through the wonders of technology, I'm able to deliver my first speech virtually to friends and supporters alike. I thank them for watching this live broadcast or by visiting peterpoulosmlc.com. <laughs> Notwithstanding that many of you would have preferred to be present this evening, I know that it won't be any less special. I am particularly grateful to the small number of guests who are permitted to be here. I take this opportunity to thank the clerk and the many parliamentary and professional staff who have afforded me all manner of courtesies and guidance in fulfilling my duties since I was sworn in. I also extend my gratitude to my parliamentary colleagues who have made me feel very welcome. I express my appreciation to the Liberal Party of Australia, New South Wales Division, for elevating me into this role, and in particular thank all the members from across the St George Illawarra province who pre-selected me for this purpose. The party relies on the decent network of volunteers who selflessly give of themselves in the hope that their representatives defend and uphold our moderate and conservative traditions. I seek to also acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and solemnly pay homage to their elders past, present and emerging. True reconciliation remains our most noble quest. In practical terms, there should be no reason to refer to any imperative to close the gap, because in a society such as ours, which upholds the laudable principles of promoting social cohesion and egalitarian opportunities for all, within this 21st century of ours, there should be no gap. 
a nation that can commit to purchasing nuclear submarines to defend its sovereignty can surely prioritise to restore the dignity of our Indigenous First Australians. As a state, we must likewise fulfil our obligations. Today, my children should not have the privilege of benefiting from a life expectancy superior to any other person, irrespective of their background or racial profile. So why is it that some children come into this world facing such an unlevel playing field? We are a better society when we confront our own inconvenient truths. This might at times be unsettling, but a truthful introspection can importantly deliver the necessary antidote against prejudice and help resolve many of those intractable social challenges. Our best days lie ahead in a society which fosters a burgeoning middle class, a society where poverty and hardship are tackled and where public policy is framed to mitigate social inequality. As Liberals, we seek to elevate the individual rather than segregate opportunity. When the Commonwealth hesitates to leap forward, then New South Wales should do so. This defines us as a premier and leading state. This is why I support the New South Wales Parliament facilitating its own Indigenous voice to Parliament. We too should engender and formalise a forum for our first Indigenous Australians to curate their preferred solutions to those issues of concern which have continued unabated from one generation to the next. This year marks 50 years since the late Neville Bonner AO became the first self-identified Indigenous Australian to enter the Commonwealth Parliament. He was actually born in northern New South Wales. I am proud to acknowledge that this forthright and courageous individual was a member of the Liberal Party. I reflect that during his own inaugural speech, he observed, and I quote, less than 200 years ago, the white man came. I say now in all sincerity that my people were shot, poisoned, hanged and broken in spirit until they became refugees in their own land. This was a powerful and evocative moment in our political history. Sadly, 50 years later, this remains a poignant reminder of how important it is today to heal the wounds and close the divide. This is our opportunity to work as equal partners to remedy Indigenous disadvantage once and for all. This must become our first and foremost priority. As honourable members fall into this chamber, they will recognise a most splendid oil painting known as the Founding of Australia which was commissioned for the 150th anniversary of the landing of the First Fleet. The raising of the flag is emblematic of those English traditions and influences within our institutions which permeate across this state and beyond. The rule of law, the separation of church and state, our language, our independent judiciary, our freedom of religion, our parliamentary democracy, freedom of association and expression, our right to lawfully own a firearm, or something we sometimes forget, the presumption of innocence until proven otherwise. These are fundamental rights and privileges which cement Western thought and liberal ideals. Some of us are rightfully offended by alternate models which aim to suppress the freedom of the individual. Some of us are remain, remain offended by totalitarian precepts. As Liberals, we remain steadfast in upholding those liberties preserved and fought for on the bloodstained battlefields of the past. Indeed, this served as a rallying cry for Sir Robert Menzies and those founding members who came together in 1944 to establish a party centred on a universal ballast of Liberalism. They sought to repudiate the horrors associated with the Second World War and as returned servicemen and women former prisoners of war, they recognise how a better society should and could look like by reinforcing the very foundations which all generations leading up to this day have benefited from. I too will commit myself to defend these very ideals. I am dutifully bound to do so. This is why I am a lifelong Liberal. It is true that symbolism is important and serves a key plank in our discourse. Not far from here, Situated in Loftus Street 
is a sandstone plinth, signifying where on the 26th of January 1788, some 233 years ago, Captain Arthur Phillip marked the focal point for European settlement. In my time, I've seen more distinguished transformer boxes, such a historic site, barely noticeable. The time is now right to appropriately recognise this culturally significant landmark by incorporating it with any transformation of Circular Quay, which must include the removal of the Carl Expressway to reveal through a design competition far more expansive views of the harbour. Yeah. Just as Jeff Kennett delivered Federation Square in Melbourne, this is the most opportune moment to create our very own Reconciliation Square, reflecting a new beginning and recognising the fusion of our Indigenous heritage with our long-standing multicultural and migrant traditions. My hope remains that Sydney is architecturally ambitious and bold. As such, we should attract investment and encourage buildings which compete with the world's tallest skyscrapers. In a century which is rapidly changing, we cannot afford to stammer and be left behind. Our regional competitors apply a can-do approach, and so must we. Sydney is our nation's gateway and a global destination, and this must remain so. The new 24-hour Western Sydney Airport, which we championed, will enhance our standing. To further assist, the Commonwealth should relocate its naval defence facilities and operations from Sydney Harbour to Port Kembla and Jarvis Bay. The freed up available space and capacity would be ideal to accommodate more tourism from cruise shipping, which will only reinforce the international visitor experience when entering the world's greatest harbour. Yarra Bay cannot achieve this and doesn't even come close. Several months ago, I was bestowed with the great honour of being sworn into the Legislative Council. At the time, New South Wales, other states and territories, as well as other nations across the globe, continued to grapple with the ongoing impacts of the pandemic. During this calamitous period, Gladys Berejiklian and her ministers demonstrated great leadership and a resolute temperament. Gladys helped keep our state safe and functioning. She helped fortify our resolve in facing this threat. And with our skilled health professionals, New South Wales did not experience the huge losses of life recorded in other parts of the world. I thank Gladys Berejiklian for her selfless service to this state and to the Liberal Party over many years. She will be missed, but never forgotten. There are many people across New South Wales who are still hurting. The mental and financial wounds run deep. Anyone who resided in a lockdown LGA, self-funded retirees who relied on the investment properties as a source of income, elderly parents often isolated or unable to interact with their family, children who were homeschooled and parents who became teachers overnight are some examples among so many deserving recognition for displaying such levels of resilience. Small businesses have also borne the brunt of this crisis and once again will spearhead our state's economic recovery. The government must not be a hindrance but an enabler of small business. This is non-negotiable. I grew up in a small business family and observed the long hours over seven days and the constant pressures attached to it. I remain and will always be a strong supporter of small business because if we enable the entrepreneurial zeal which is innate within every individual to flourish, then society as a whole prospers. It remains true that small business entrepreneurs are not leaners, but lifters. We cannot therefore allow them to become our forgotten people, and we won't. This has been, there has been much debate about the efficacy of vaccination. At times, this has been an unnecessarily polarising issue. I assert that vaccines save lives and recognise that our scientists and professional medical staff, doctors and nurses project and showcase the best attributes of humanity. So I am unequivocal in supporting vaccinations and the advice of our medical experts. I acknowledge that overwhelmingly here in New South Wales, adults have done the right thing for themselves, their families and our great state. 
They have diligently sought to be vaccinated and certainly deserve our gratitude for the, how they have adapted and responded to this unprecedented crisis. However, there remains to this day a number of our citizens who choose not to be vaccinated. This is their choice and I respect their right to do so. It is my considered view that a just and fair society should both accommodate and see a purpose for conscientious objectors. As Liberals, we once expressed our strenuous opposition to voluntary student unionism because we felt that the individual has and must retain the fundamental right to choose whether they join a union or not. Mm -hmm. Similarly, the individual should retain the same right to decide whether they are vaccinated or not. Indeed, a liberal pluralist society enshrines a set of fundamental principles which I avow, embrace and will fight to uphold. Any civil society has an obligation to adhere to a set of values and ideals. As a Liberal, I am no different. I see it as my role to play a small part in seeking to remain anchored to our philosophical traditions, which guide our responses to political events, or in formulating policies which encourages free enterprise and recognises the unique worth of the individual. It has never been my style to prevaricate on fundamental core values. I do not consider capitalism antithetical. It remains the foundation of delivering a standard of living which is unsurpassed because there is no other alternative. Market-based solutions optimises outcomes and in the rare circumstances where there is failure, then governments have a role to assist. But it doesn't just end there. I believe when it comes to matters of conscience, our Liberal Party room must continue to uphold the fundamental privilege of a conscience vote. I came into the Legislative Council to fill a casual vacancy caused by the retirement of the Honourable John Ajaka. I wish to acknowledge John's stewardship and his tremendous and ongoing contributions as a member, minister, president and party stalwart. I once served on Rockdale City Council with John. He has been a mentor to me and I will strive to build on his legacy and I thank him for his friendship. My own continuous 28-year journey in the Liberal Party has afforded me tremendous opportunities and in senior roles. If the party can be described as a broad church, then it's fair to say that I have pretty much sat on every pew, <laughs> on both sides of every aisle within it. <clears throat> I'm also a coalitionist. I recognise that the Liberal Party functions at its best when the National Party is at its best. Yeah. Our state has benefited from a great many and varied projects being delivered across regional and rural New South Wales as a result of the efforts of our coalition. Perhaps the greatest everlasting project currently underway is the massive inland rail which will buttress regional centres and achieve significant economic and long-standing environmental benefits. A new steel spine will crisscross New South Wales, turbocharging our regional economic renaissance, helping to transfer goods and ancillary benefits along key intermodal junctions and in the new regional activation precincts, culminating in more job opportunities and business enterprises. The regional energy zones will catalyse a huge investment pipeline into renewables and clean energy initiatives. Mm -hmm. This has already attracted global acclaim as the state recalibrates its capabilities towards net zero emissions and a more sustainable future. As we find ourselves in a post-COVID reconstructive environment and with interest rates still at historic lows, the time is now more than ideal to build our first very fast train network. Ideally, any dedicated high-speed rail corridor must accommodate speeds in excess of 300 kilometres an hour, and in the first instance should run from Sydney to Canberra and Newcastle to Sydney. Mm -hmm. Currently, China accounts for two-thirds of the world's entire total high-speed railway network, and yet here we cannot even begin one. The government sensibly sought advice for its future blueprint through the scholarship of Professor Andrew McNaughton. Now let's make it happen. 
I expect more because this government has achieved such a remarkable and Herculean transformation of our ageing infrastructure. We are proven performance because we deliver on what we promise. This government, more than any other, has completed projects unravelling bottlenecks and overturning through methodical planning 16 years of gross labour intransigence and inaction. For this reason, I am confident to push ahead with further ambitious programs of renewal in anticipation that families would be able to relocate from across Greater Sydney into regional centres where lifestyle changes would engender more affordable housing facilitate further decentralisation, create more jobs and help us to value capture. So you can add my voice and strong advocacy with many others in urging the government to duplicate the South Coast Rail Line to Wollongong, together with completing the Maldon to Dombarden Rail Corridor to establish additional freight capacity and achieve faster travel times for commuters from the South Coast, in particular Wollongong to Sydney. As someone who worked in Wollongong and travelled there each day from Sydney, I recognise the expectation that these projects are finally delivered. Additionally, the remaining stages of the M6 should be finalised and, and work commenced to complete the missing links connecting the Illawarra with Sutherland and St George. The government has advocated to reinstate a ferry service from La Perouse to Cornell but perhaps a more visionary approach would be to connect the eastern suburbs with the south by extending the light rail to Cronulla via Cornell and under the heads of Botany Bay, a proposal previously referred to as the Baylight Express. Whilst I welcome the benefits of a coalition because it undoubtedly helps us achieve government, I know that like any partnership, occasionally there will arise circumstances where we need to manage our differences. I will be respectful and, when necessary, forthright in expressing views that resonate with Liberal supporters. Our universal obligation must be to preserve our environment and shield it from continuous aftershocks. Last year's bushfires were a devastating reminder that our sensitive habitats remain exposed and must be preserved and valued based on proven conservation approaches. It is time for a, it is time for a rethink. The overwhelming number of wild horses in the delicate and very significant Kosciuszko National Park is unacceptable. Nature must be prioritised and given the benefit of the doubt. So, so I wholeheartedly applaud the current draft plan aimed at providing relief to these wilderness areas. Time also isn't a luxury for any of us when it comes to our current approaches to native forest logging and rates of land clearing. This isn't good for our native habitats, this isn't good enough for our koalas and invariably will compound the ongoing impacts of climate change. Of course we need a sustainable and ongoing timber industry to help create jobs, deliver economic opportunities for our regions and provide essential building materials. But what is the end game here? Our current practices have us on a trajectory which emasculates the very timber industry we want to continue and disrupts the environmental <coughs> stewardship for future generations. Today, land clearing rates are unsustainable. In some instances, satellite images cannot keep pace with what is happening on the ground. It's important to further incentivise private landholders to immediately preserve our precious biodiversity assets. Private property rights are fundamental. As a Liberal, believe me, I know. And so we must fairly incentivise landholders to adopt a different and more sustainable approach as much as we must deliver a financial assistance package for industry to cease logging in native forests. We ought to be guided by sound scientific and sustainability principles. We are obligated to do so both to current and future generations. And we owe it to nature. Sir Robert Menzies, remains our foremost exemplar as both a political thinker and successful statesman. He experienced personal setbacks but rose above each hurdle to establish a formidable political movement. One of his enduring legacies included focusing on home ownership and affordability, ensuring that one's ability to own a home should be an achievable aspiration and within the reach of all who seek it. 
Today, the astronomical housing bubble makes it profoundly difficult for especially young entrants to achieve this dream. Comprehensive tax reform can address some of this, and it just so happens that the Commonwealth remains in the pole position to further assist. The 2021 New South Wales Intergenerational Report reinforces that our revenue growth is projected to drop and will be surpassed by spending growth. Everyone knows what needs to be done. You just need the courage of John Howard and Peter Costello to make it so. Whilst first home buyer packages provide a useful head start, the need remains for more supply to be delivered into the market. However, I am concerned that the current housing bubble will once again drive through higher land valuations, financial imposts onto landholders ending up being transferred to buyers and tenants. More often, land tax hurts our self-funded retirees and our mum and dad inv investors who appear asset rich but experience limited income returns and more frequently become smothered by additional charges such as rates and insurance. Similarly, those who land bank and intend to deliver more housing lots cannot remain in an indefinite holding pattern, sinking under the weight of debt, hoping through pot luck that a planner might emerge to sign off on these critical projects. This remains unacceptable, and especially during the current pandemic, the state has similarly transferred a greater risk profile onto the landlord. Without landlords, there would be no household or commercial properties to rent from. So let's stop our universal predisposition towards hammering landlords, investors and developers by taking their contributions for granted. Today, there is another factor which is impacting our housing market and relates to an intergenerational impasse. Our ageing baby boomers lack the incentive to downsize and help provide for more options for families eager to move into well-established communities. This is why, as an immediate measure, I support the over 65 downsizers receiving stamp duty concessions when purchasing their next primary place of residence, or when they contribute towards their children's first home purchase in their role as a mum and dad bank. This could assist in achieving more property listings and is an area where New South Wales currently lags behind other states. I have been shaped and influenced by numerous factors in my life. My orthodox faith is an important consideration and construct in guiding me. Whilst it isn't my role to proselytise, and I respect everyone's right to maintain their religious beliefs in equal measure to those who do not believe at all, I am somewhat comforted that for all the historical missteps committed in the past in the name of religion, there do exist numerous examples where Christian teachings have preserved humanity in the face of great and monumental upheaval. The first relates to the courage of Archbishop Damaskinos of Athens, who during the Second World War confronted the scourge of Nazism and interceded to protect thousands of Jews from deportation. He famously marched into the office of SS General Jürgen Stroop, the very individual who had personally overseen the destruction of the Warsaw Ghetto, and presented him with a letter condemning any attempt to further discriminate on racial or religious grounds. The General was so outraged by the temerity of Damaskinos that he threatened to have him shot, to which the Archbishop retorted in part, and I quote, According to the traditions of the Greek Orthodox Church, our prelates are hanged and not shot. Please respect our traditions. <laughs> the defiance of Damaskinos directly saved Jews through his edict to issue false baptismal certificates and identif identification cards to any person seeking refuge. For his actions, he was honoured as righteous among the nations. The second significant figure who exemplified the teachings of the Orthodox Church is encapsulated by the actions of Archbishop Yakovos of America. Not only did he join shoulder to shoulder with Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in the march to Selma, Alabama, together they graced the cover of the iconic Life magazine. Archbishop Yakovos championed civil rights and the emancipation of African Americans to register to vote. 
For his efforts, he faced persecution, condemnation and threats. He excelled in a turbulent part of history and was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. These were two extraordinary men of faith representing hope. <coughs> like them, I repudiate the discrimination and injustice against anyone. Our unique asset recycling and reform agenda helps to accelerate renewing our infrastructure and deliver contemporary public benefits. The time is right to completely decouple the state from the energy distribution market. Such proceeds should be reinvested towards a regional hospital rebuild fund, in addition to boosting the Community Housing Innovation Fund for social housing and directing more funding into Investment New South Wales to enhance our research and innovation capabilities. The future of work will be correlated towards our investments around the digital economy and new start-ups associated with the smart economy. Our benchmark should be Israel. The work around Tech Central is a great initiative, but just as Israel takes a punt and invests significant capital in new enterprises, so must we. Water security and the health of waterways will also be a great challenge for all of us. The water quality and overall health of our urban waterways, such as the Georges River, Cooks River and Woolai Creek deserve greater funding for rehabilitation. Inasmuch as our current dam levels remain high, it cannot be assumed that this will always be the case. For this reason, I encourage the expansion of the Kernel desalination plant to help preserve Sydney's long-term drinking water supply. Such a response doesn't negate any further measures to expand our capacity to use recycled water for industry and commercial means. We can, in fact, do both. In recent times, our conventional thinking around work-life balance has been tested, and rightfully so. Advances in technology will consolidate working from home arrangements. Moving forward, I believe that New South Wales should trial a shortened four-day working week without compromising workers' pay or entitlements. Importantly, this enables individuals to pursue other interests or family responsibilities and recognises that our productivity need not fall because we can work smarter and we do. This approach will make us a world leader and expand our life choices. The Liberal Party advanced paid parental leave and can lead on this initiative as well. A four day working week will importantly enable more women to return to the workforce. This century should be about empowerment and a new paradigm of balancing all our needs and wants. Throughout my political odyssey, I have benefited from the support of so many. To all of you who have assisted me, I extend to you my appreciation. I have gained much practical experience in the political arena and during my employment with several members of parliament. Amongst them, I recognise my time with you, Mr President, and periods working for the Honourable Don Harwin, the Member for Miranda Eleni Pedernos and Senator the Honourable Conchetta Ferravani Wells. To each of you, I thank you for affording me the great privilege of working for you and granting me access to learn about the true inner workings of the Parliament, the functions of government, inasmuch as the special art that is politics. There are several pillars of long standing and individual friendships which have endured over many years and assisted me to be where I am today. I acknowledge the Vice President of the Party, Christopher Rath, and thank him for his great support, loyalty and friendship. The Parliament is waiting for someone like you, Chris, and I look forward to the moment when you too can fulfil your personal aspirations. Yeah. I similarly thank yeah. several great friends over many years, Richard Shields, Nicholas Vivaris and his wife, Dorette, John Chadid, Anthony Vidanis, along with one of the most upstanding individuals I know in Councillor Michael Nargi. I appreciate your collective and unwavering support. Amongst my many friends and supporters, there is one individual who is relentless in his support for me. He's indefatigable and one of the most focused thought leaders in this government. To Matt Keane, I thank you for your guidance, friendship and for inviting me to work for you. Matt Keane doesn't fire blanks. <laughs> in years to come, he will be remembered in years to come, he will be remembered for, importantly, among so many things, expanding our national parks, accelerating the take-up of electrical vehicles whilst formalising fast-charging networks across New South Wales, 
phasing out single-use plastics, slashing emissions by 50% below 2005 levels by 2030, making New South Wales a global hydrogen superpower and transitioning our energy market to more renewables and improving the capacity of the electricity transmission network. Now, as our Treasurer, there is no doubt you are only warming up. I acknowledge my late grandparents, Emmanuel and Diamanta Lavanos, who following the war paved the way in the early 1950s for a generation to follow and prosper in a newfound haven. To my uncles, aunts and cousins, I thank each of you for your long-standing influences and support. To my mother-in-law, Christina Patsos, as well as Andrew, Joanne and Katerina, I give thanks for everything you've done in support of the family. To Trent Zimmerman, who I once served with as a vice president of the party, James Wallace, Mark and Adler Cure, Gareth Ward, Lee and Gail Evans, Mark Speakman and Car Carmelo Pesci, I recognise what you do every day for our party and for your role in helping me. Mr President, I seek the leave of the House to incorporate a list of names of persons to whom I express my thanks and appreciations in Hansard. I thank the House. Finally I thank, finally, I thank my close friends from the LGOC community, Charles Perrottet, Dallas McInerney, Harry Stutchbury, Aaron Henry, for helping to rejuvenate our focus in local government and collaborating with Mary Lou Jarvis, Sally Betts, Jackie Munro and Aileen MacDonald to boost our female representation. To my staff, Nicholas Smirdley and Harris Strangus, thank you for kick-starting the next phase of the journey. I sincerely thank Premier Perrottet, who I've known for many years. We've certainly shared a few adventures together. He endorsed my candidacy with warm words of encouragement and wise counsel. When he delivered his inaugural speech, he thanked me, and today I can reciprocate. I've had the benefit of knowing what motivates a Premier and recognise that the times do in fact suit him and our government best. Premier, I'm always around, and if you need anything, just text me your coordinates and air support will be on the way. <laughs> to my father, John, born in Platanos, Ajaia, and my mother, born in Ayos Nicolaos, Laconia, I acknowledge your immeasurable sacrifices when supporting my brother, Emmanuel, whom, I, whom I'm immensely proud of, and I. Both of you migrated to New South Wales over 65 years ago. Each of you experienced great hardship and poverty. You survived the war and a famine to somehow venture to a great southern land when Sir Robert Menzies was Prime Minister, so that your son could stand here today as a proud Greek Australian, reflecting the diversity and presenting the changing face of the Liberal Party. To my precious children, Maria, John and Christina, I hope I can make a difference in your lives and those of others. I'm proud of each of you and I will always be your favourite dad. <laughs> to my wife, Vicky, I recognise your special qualities, which are often sorely tested as a mother, wife and friend. Our union began 21 years ago and remains unbroken. I can never thank you enough for what you have done to support my political aspirations and the family. You grew up in Western Sydney as part of an often marginalised community which you've never forgotten about. As we approach Christmas, in what has been an especially tough time, your old neighbourhood will project all that they can through their outdoor lighting displays. They remain a group of individuals who work hard and occasionally dedicate their limited disposable incomes for life's pleasures. They are aspirational, decent, productive and keep our state going. They are Western Sydney. Ultimately, our objective must remain that no one should be left behind. No one. This is what I genuinely believe and this is what a good government such as ours should always remember. Before Almighty God, I reaffirm my faith and know that my path towards salvation and everlasting life can only come through my Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. So in years to come, 
before I am laid to rest in a place of green pasture, I hope that my children, nephew George and nieces Constance, Egeliki and Anastasia, and perhaps some of you, might feel with pride that through the Liberal Party, in my public service, in defence of liberty, individual freedom, and in the pursuit of happiness, that by my actions, I helped in a small way to make tomorrow a little better than it is today.